this particular session, uh, you know, uh, the first time uh, I had, had, a, you know, had a similar sort of session, it was, uh, it was more like an unblocked kind of session. Where the idea was to kind of, you know, uh, to uh, kind of talk about JavaScript, right? <laughs> kind of get together and uh, have an informal discussion around uh, you know, maybe some of the some of the issues that you are facing or some pet peeve you have or something like that. Uh, you know, we'll pick some topics uh, and kind of go from there. It's not like a set agenda, so we can just go over wherever. Uh, so yeah, so that's that's kind of the uh, the goal behind the session. Uh, so feel free to interrupt any time you know, if you want to talk uh, about something that you want to talk about. Uh, but otherwise, I kind of wanted to uh, go through a bunch of stuff. Before I go that. Good that though, if you've attended the previous two sessions, you already know uh, the drill. So I have this little console that I, uh, you know, used to do my demos in. If you haven't been to the other two sessions, then I'll very quickly tell you what this console does. So basically, I can write little pieces of script here, uh, hit Control Enter to run them. If I type it correctly without errors, uh, and uh, you know, alert is annoying, so you can do this. Say print, and then it shows up on the, on the right hand side. If there are errors in your script, then uh, the errors come up to the bottom right hand corner. Uh, this, uh, I should probably do some CSS stuff to make it a little smaller to fit inside those little percent 68. <coughs> so I'm kind of zoomed in, that's why the, the error page goes up outside. Hopefully, I'll type without errors. But if I do make errors, you can tell me. Uh, so that's the console. Uh, yeah, that's the first demo. So, you know, I kind of have a bunch of stuff that we can talk about here. We can talk about functions, uh, you know, how we can do object oriented development in JavaScript and so on. Maybe we can uh, pick and choose. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe we can talk about O in JavaScript, right? Uh, maybe we spoke a lot about uh, functions uh, throughout this track today, I guess. Uh, so, so, one thing, uh, uh, you know, in, in JavaScript, right? In fact, in the, in the functional programming session, I was speaking to you about JavaScript being a prototype, uh, prototypal language, right? Now, what do we mean by that? Has, has anybody here heard of the, uh, the design pattern called prototype? Full. Prototype design pattern. Full. So we have about five, six people here. Um, yeah. So the prototype design pattern is a is a creational pattern, right? Where the idea is, uh, it's basically a, a prescription, right? It's a way of uh, implementing. Uh, that aspect of your application where you are instantiating objects, right? So the entire classification of creational patterns are all patterns which help you uh, instantiate objects in loosely coupled ways, you know, in best practice ways. So prototype is one such pattern, right? So creational pattern helps you create objects. JavaScript as a language has been designed, ground up as a prototype language, where um, where the primary uh, prototypes are the primary mechanism for uh, code reads in JavaScript, right? Um, so, you know, in, in static, ob I mean, object-oriented, statically typed object-oriented languages like C++ and C Sharp, we are used to defining classes, right? Classes are essentially templates for what an object is going to look like at runtime. Uh, you define your classes, you instantiate them, you call methods on it, access number of fields and whatnot. <coughs> it turns out that uh, JavaScript supports this style of development also, right? So. Uh, you know, you are you, you might have you might have done stuff like this, right? You might have done function person, and uh, even though I'm defining a function, which is a bit of a, uh, a weird weird aspect of JavaScript, right? I'm defining a class, but the syntax is uh, so you keep running into uh, odd uh, things like this in the language, right? So here, for instance, I'd say uh, ideally, what you probably do is define a constructor function that. Uh, Maybe it does nothing in this case, and then I'll say prototype dot name equals uh, maybe uh, none. Then I'll say person dot prototype dot print equals function. You know, maybe I'll say uh, print name is this dot name. Now I have defined a class, right? This class, but this particular class, class in quotes. Then I define a class. Uh, and this class has a, a field, a member field called name, and uh, a member method called print. So how do I use this? The using bit looks a lot like uh, Java or C sharp or whatever, right? So I can say var p equals new person, uh, and say p dot 
print, I guess, right? And it, it prints that. Or I can assign a name and uh, SAP dot name equals who and you know that works. Now the question is, you know, what what is really happening here? Uh, first of all, the, a little history behind this. So Brendan Eich is the inventor of the language. So he was tasked with you know coming up with the programming language for Netscape Navigator in like you know ridiculous amounts of time. Like he was asked to do it like you know in, in very very short amounts of time. So that's how he came up with. Uh, came up with JavaScript. So the warts of JavaScript can probably be blamed on the fact that he was in the really tight deadline. He was also asked with, tasked with the job of attracting Java developers. I mean, um, the language is called JavaScript, right? So, uh, recently there was a conference in, uh, I think last year, called Mix in Las Vegas, where uh, uh, Douglas Crockford, Douglas Crockford is, a, is a, like a JavaScript guru, he works for Yahoo. He's on the ICMA script standards body and all that. Uh, so he was there on a panel. Like it was like a discussion panel. I think we're going to have one today here. Uh, a discussion panel where he was there on stage and people could ask him questions. He would give answers. Uh, so somebody mentioned about uh, the, the fact that JavaScript uh, is really not a scripting language. Right? If you define a scripting language as some special purpose language, which is somehow limited in functionality, which is intended for one particular task. I mean, that's what we typically say mean when we say it's a, something is a scripting language, right? Uh, maybe a scripting language that extends Photoshop, a scripting language that allows you to, uh, you know, automate uh, office art. Okay. So those are very special purpose and somewhat limited in uh, scope of functionality. So the, the person on the stage was mentioning that JavaScript is not such a language. It's a general purpose language. It's a Turing complete language. You can build, uh, you know, pretty much anything you want with JavaScript. So Douglas Crockford made a comment. So he's saying, so what he's essentially saying is, uh, JavaScript is not a scripting language, and we all know it's not Java. And then it's a completely <laughs> wrong name for the language, right? We're calling it JavaScript, but it's not Java or a scripting language. Uh, which actually is a, a very good point. So the, the reason why it was called JavaScript is because it was cool to name things Java with the, with the Java name, right? At that, at that time. But <laughs> that's why the standard name for the language is ECMAScript, ECMA script, which is about as uncool as it can get, I guess, right? Um, <coughs> so, this. Uh, um, so this impact you're seeing here was created so that Java people will look at this code and you know feel happy about it. But essentially, what's happening here is something quite different, uh, you know, under the covers. <clears throat> Under the covers, what is happening is something very similar to what they showed in the other like, morning, like object.create. So this is the JavaScript prescribed way of creating objects, right? So if you want to create an object, you do this. Object.create, provide a prototype as the first parameter. And, okay, so let's not worry about the second parameter for now. <coughs> right, and then, uh, <coughs> or, uh, maybe I shouldn't bang the keyboard so hard. Duct tape is letting us down here. Everybody said very still. Remove this. <laughs> Uh, so let's say I have something like you know name is that age is that so I can now say o dot go to the back age and that prints that uh, so this is the JavaScript way of creating things and this looks nothing like I mean if, if Java developers had seen this they would run away right what that's an object creation in fact <coughs> it turns out this is what JavaScript is designed to do so what you're doing here is you're creating an object called o and the object's prototype is this particular thing here. So here essentially you are saying that, it's, it's the prototype design pattern. So we are saying that this is what my object should look like. It should have a property called name and it should have a property called age. Now create another object for me which is based on this prototype. So object.create will basically create the object. So if you, you know, essentially what happens here is, so when I say something like uh, uh, o.age, right, I'm accessing o.age here, JavaScript has this concept of objects can have own properties. Right, objects can have properties that have been created directly on uh, uh, on the object, 
and objects and properties and members that are part of the prototype or the object's prototype. So essentially here what is happening is when I say o dot age, right, the JavaScript runtime has to figure out where this property is. So first it's going to look at what are all the own properties on that particular object. Thus a property called age exists on O. Uh, if it exists, great, it just resolves to that, gets the value and that's done, right? Uh, it could also happen that there is no property called age on O. In that case, Dr. Frontend will go find out what is the prototype of O. Then look at the prototype and see whether that prototype has a property and it keeps walking this prototype chain. So you can, this can go n levels, right? So I can uh, so I can say var o2 equals object dot create of o and I can uh, create dot the second parameter later. So here I'll say o2 dot, uh, you know, uh, say o2 dot page equals 20 print o2 dot page, right? Um, so, so here when I say o2 dot page, what is the, what is the job from time doing? It's going and seeing if o2 itself has a property called it does not. Then it says what is the prototype? Prototype is o. Does O have a property called age? It does not. What is O's property? Uh, prototype. O's prototype is this particular object here, which is a temporary object that created. That indeed does have a property called age. So that's what is getting written here, and uh, you know, that's how that's how the prototype resolution works, right? <coughs> um, so so here you will notice that you know there are no types involved here, right? Uh, not in the person case. With this case, there are no types here. What the prototype here itself is another object, right? And the new instance is also an object. So there is no concept of instantiating an object from a type, which we are familiar with in static languages, right? So when you instantiate a new object, you're saying this object is of a particular type. So what do you guys think? What kind of a language is JavaScript? Is JavaScript a strongly typed language uh, or not? No, no. So what kind of language is it? Sorry? Dynamically typed. Uh, it is definitely dynamically typed. Uh, but I guess the, the technically correct term is duct typing. Duct typing. Duct typing. Duct typing is an interesting concept that uh, is associated with JavaScript. Somebody mentioned weakly typed. <coughs> JavaScript can be thought of as a weakly typed language. There are types, right? Uh, this, the guy should talk more. Do you know what the types are in JavaScript? String, object. Object. Uh, number, number. Nobody can forget object, right? String, undefined, string, string, number, 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 array, 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 Right? So there are many frameworks which attempt to build a type system on top of JavaScript and do various you know interesting things. Really, but really, you know, it's kind of uh, not what it's meant to be. They're really fighting the language to build a type system on top of a weekly type language. Uh, so with ECMAScript 5, they introduce object of create where they really embrace the strengths of the language. It's a prototype language. Let's talk about object of create. Uh, I mean, let's talk about object creation the way it was meant. When you do var p dot p equals new person, what is essentially happening in, internally? Is something like object dot create. So if I were to you know write uh, rewrite this object creation, uh, you know as to what actually happens under the covers, essentially something like this happening. Uh, let's say var p two, I'll say okay, and I'll assign this to an empty object, and then I'll say person dot call of p two, right? And then I'll write a line of code which is not really valid. Because it's not possible to do this in, in JavaScript, at least ECMAScript JavaScript, uh, compliant JavaScript. You can do it in Firefox and some of the other JavaScript engines where you can assign a prototype for an object by saying underscore underscore prototype and whatnot, but that's an extension. But you know, in standard JavaScript, this is not possible. So let's say I say p2.prototype equals person.prototype. So imagine that you know I could write these three lines of code. This is what this single line of code translates to. So if you notice here, uh, I'm still creating an empty new object. And I'm calling this as a constructor function. In fact, in JavaScript, this thing is called as a constructor function. It's not called as a class. So person here is not a class. It's a constructor function. It constructs an object. And then I'm saying here, uh, person dot call of p2. So imagine, you know, sometimes you write code like this, right? So in your constructor function, you actually do some constructing. So you say this dot, uh, uh, let's say gender is f, something, right? <coughs> so 
you know, that initialization happens when the constructor is called. So here, uh, how many of you know what call is? You want to take a shot? Exactly. It's also apply method. Um, so, <coughs> so what is call, right? So here, person is not a class. It's a function. You know, what gave away the fact that it's a function? He said it's a function, right? So it's not a class. Um, so all functions in JavaScript have are themselves objects, right? Uh, and it has member methods. So a function has a member method, which in turn is a function. Beginning person now, I guess, right? Um, but but that's the case. So dot call here is a member method on the function object. Right? Uh, so what what can you do with call? Uh, so let's let's create let's create a very simple function here. So for example, I say function foo, right? And I say print foo. So how can I call this? I can call this like this, right? Uh, Why doesn't it pass? Prototype. 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 Oh. No, it will just create a. Oh, no, no, last time. This one. <coughs> yeah, errors, right? Yeah. No? That I box. Oh, yeah, you're right. Hmm, why didn't the error come there? So, <coughs> this thing prints that, right? Now, how, how else can you call this function? I can also say foo.call. And uh, let's take a here. And you can see that uh, among all this output, you can see that the foo is getting printed, right? Anyway, so this is also the way of calling this particular function. So you might wonder why do you have that, right? Why it seems redundant. I mean, when I can call it like this, why do why introduce another way of doing it? Uh, the reason is this. So if, let's say here I do something like this. I say this dot bar, right? Okay. <clears throat> then I can do this. I can say foo uh, dot call. And I can pass an object here, and I can create a property that it expects. So I can say bar is 10. Right? Um, so now you can see that uh, prints. Maybe I'll save something. So you can see it prints foo dash 10 here. Right? So now do you see what uh, what call does? Does this particular parameter here, the first parameter, is basically the, this inside that function? Right? That's that becomes a context for that particular function call. Um, so that's what I have done in the uh, in the pseudo code here. So it creates an empty object, then it invokes that particular function, passing this object as the context for that particular constructor, which means your gender and all gets created, and then I assign the prototype for this object to that object. So this prototype hookup is what happens when you do object dot create. So this essentially this kind of code is actually running it. In fact, go look up a, a blog post by Douglas Stockford where he actually provides uh, an implementation of object.create for pre ECMAScript 5 language uh, versions of the JavaScript engine. So if you have a JavaScript uh, ES, compliant with ES3, which does not have object.create, you can use a shim that has been implemented by Douglas Stockford. It's a very simple, like three lines of code. It's just very similar to something like this. And uh, you know that, that implements the object.create there. So <coughs> even though you can do this, this is what is ha happening under uh, under the covers. Still taking advantage of the prototypal nature of the language. Um, so and that's like a lot of theory about uh, about the prototypal nature of the language. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about was uh, hey, uh, yeah. The question about classes: Is there any way I can uh, like clone? Uh, like any way I can show inheritance? I can do inheritance in JavaScript. Yes. So this is inherited. Okay. So no, but uh, so for your second object, object dot create O, but O two doesn't have anything by itself. So can I define a prototype for O two too? You you kept saying that there is a second argument, but you kind of oh, skipped. Oh, the second argument. Sorry. Um, yeah, good catch. I want to talk about the second argument to object dot create, right? So the second argument to object dot create is basically own properties for that object. So here the first, what is the first argument? The first argument is a prototype, right? So we want O to inherit from that, from this. When I say inherit from, what I mean is the new object's prototype will be this object, right? And it's, it's not very rarely do you want to just create a prototype of another object and do nothing with it. That object probably will have its own functionality, right? You are you are inheriting and overriding, maybe. You are inheriting and enhancing, augmenting functionality. So how do you do that? So with ECMAScript 5, what you can do is you can pass uh, another object here as a second parameter, 
which is basically a dictionary of properties that will be available in the new object. So for example, here I have name and age. Let's say I want to add gender as a property here. So I can say the property name is gender and the value needs to be another object which is called as the property descriptor for that. So there are some interesting capabilities in ECMAScript 5. Like you can, uh, first of all you can set a default value. So I'll set that. Then you can do stuff like this. I can control whether that will be writable or not. So if I say writable is true, uh, then that means that through this object I can assign a value to the gender property. Otherwise I cannot. Uh, there's something called enumerable, which can be again true or false. And see now I remember it. Good morning, I couldn't remember this. Configurable, which which uh, which basically controls whether this which controls whether this configuration for this property. Uh, can be changed or not. So let me show you some examples of that. Which one? Enumerable or configurable? Configurable. Enumerable controls whether you can use reflection to see whether this object has that property or not. I'll show you how that works. So here, um, um, what do we have? So we have name, age, and gender, right? So I can say print o dot name. Um, let me get rid of all this other stuff at the top. So output doesn't get cluttered. Right. Right. So if I say print o dot name, I get foo, right? So no, no surprise there because o's prototype has name, and uh, o dot age prints twenty. Uh, and then if I say o dot gender, you see that it prints x, right? And uh, I can assign a value to it as well. I can say o dot gender equals m, and uh, if I and that so it prints f first and then it prints m so it works just like a just like a regular property right but the interesting thing is there is a property descriptor associated with that so for instance if i just go ahead and make this false which means object is not writable anymore so now you now do you see that you know that f doesn't change right even though i'm assigning m to it that line is just ignored right the javascript runtime sees that gender is a non writable property this assignment has no effect if you run this in strict mode javascript this is throw an error uh, strict mode is another feature in uh, ECMAScript 5. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one thing. Another thing is enumerable. So you know, if you, uh, there are you can do reflection in JavaScript. How many of you know that you can do reflection in JavaScript? And what I mean by reflection is to dynamically in, uh, inspect an object to see what members it has. Right? That's one of the things that you can do with reflection uh, among others. So you can do that in JavaScript. So for instance, you can write code like this. You can say for for uh, let's say p in o, right? And you can say print p. Uh, so it says name age, right? So now I was missing a new variable. Ah, I was wondering about that. Where did where did gender go? <coughs> so now it prints gender, name, and age. So this we are basically introspecting over the uh, over the object to see what properties it has. Now you probably can tell what will happen if I say false, and you know what's the default also. What is the default? False, false. Because I made a type. So now you can see that name age is there. Gender is not even showing up in the as a property here. But you can still use it, right? I can still assign uh, values to it. As in, if I make this writable, uh, it will change. Um, so it does change from F to M, but it's not there. So it's basically like a hidden hidden property. Uh, or for that matter, you don't have to do this. There's another ECMAScript. Uh, Thing called as object or keys, where you can pass a pass an object and it will return the uh, return the members. So here, see, object or keys returns nothing, right? Now the the uh, interesting thing about object or keys is it's not like for var i in. So when you say for var i in some object, uh, it will actually um, it will actually uh, enumerate through all the properties of the all the own properties of the object and all the properties of the prototype. So it will first iterate through all the properties of O. Then it will go. What is the host prototype? It will go through all the prototype, you know, prototype, prototype until it hits object or prototype. So that's why you are seeing all that. Object or keys is a little different because it will only list own prototypes. I mean, own uh, properties. So if I here, since we said false, it's saying nothing is there. If I say true, it says gender. In the age and name are there, right? But it's in the prototype. Object or keys will not give you the non-own uh, members. Um, there's another. There's another member. <coughs> I don't know if I have it here. 
get, uh, does anybody remember? Get own properties. Okay, there's, there's another function in object uh, that you can go look up, which does what for var i and does. It will walk your uh, prototype chain and tell you what are all the has properties. Has own property. Has own property. Huh, has own property tells you whether uh, thing ha that, that object has that property or not. There is, just like keys, there is another one. Uh, we don't have connectivity here. Uh, or I can look up another session. In fact, in Bangalore, uh, JS4, we had a session on ECMAScript 5. There, I think I might have spoken about this. See, get own property names. <coughs> that doesn't sound very promising though, right? Get own property names does the does the same thing. Um, I think the, the, um, the get own property names does the same thing as object properties, <laughs> but uh, the difference is it does not honor the enumerable. So even if you say enumerable is false, it will still give you the property name. What can I say? Just for funny. But but there are some other uh, uh, interesting side effects of making enumerable false. Like once what happened, I know I wanted to be diligent, I made some properties enumerable, some properties not enumerable. And then I was debugging the code and the debugger, for some reason I couldn't, uh, I forgot that I had made enumerable as false. I couldn't see the object properties. So I was like, wait a second, I'm assigning the property here, but debugger is not showing this. So it turned out that even the debugger honors enumerable. So if you say enumerable is false, the debugger itself won't show you that uh, property in the, in the, you know, quick watch window or something like that. But yeah, so get own property names is different. Um, but if you want to walk the prototype chain, I, I guess the, pretty much the only option is to do for I in, right? Um, so these are some interesting things. Configurable, what it does is it allows you to, um, it's like a, uh, it allows you to say whether this configuration can be subsequently changed or not. So before you can see how that makes sense, you need to know how you can change. So for instance, right? In code, if I want to make this property from writable to non-writable, I can write, do something like this. I can say object.define property, I can pass that object, I can pass the property name, and I can pass a new descriptor. So here I can say uh, value is, doesn't matter. I can say writable is false, and I can say enumerable, whatever, enumerable is true maybe. Uh, Let's forget about configurable. All right. So now, um, what have I done? So here, I have writable as true. So maybe I'll make this writable as false, and I'll make this as writable true. Right? I'm changing the configuration for that particular property. So here, if I say gender is m, uh, and then say print o dot gender, uh, what should we get? F. F. So here I'll say gender is n and print o dot gender. Uh, maybe that was subtle. I'll just clear this stuff. So you can see that uh, in the first case this had no effect. In this case it really changed, right? It became m. Why? Because I did an object or define property here and changed the proper descriptor for gender from uh, writable to uh, I mean non-writable to writable. What configurable does is it allows you to configure whether you can do this or not. If you say configurable is false, this will have no effect. The original configuration is permanent. You can't change it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, there are all these sort, you know, features that uh, like ES5 has brought in, and it you know, really makes sense to use them, right? So uh, sometimes I think that JavaScript is too dynamic for its own good, right? You can just tack on properties whenever you want. You can just you know take properties. You can just you know go crazy. But uh, the configurable uh, is true over there. Uh, on top. Yes. Okay, and I uh, put it uh, later on. I declare it as false. So, yes. what kind of configuration? Like, Are you saying if I say configurable is false and then change the configurable to true later on, what? Uh, it shouldn't change. That's what I would expect. So his question was, if you made configurable as false, which means you cannot change the configuration, can you change configurable to true subsequently? You should not do it, right? Because configurable is also a property. 
<laughs> yeah. So what what these uh, you know these yeah. aspects of ECMAScript five does is it brings a little you know it limits your language really right we are like really limiting stuff here we are saying you, you cannot write to this you cannot do this you cannot do that but that's actually a good thing because you know sometimes you want to do that sometimes you want to have a property which you don't want clients to modify right how can you implement something like that you can use this okay. yeah. Is this uh, configuration is apply, applicable for or already existing objects like window and event, window or error? Um, that is for DOM objects. Yeah. Uh, in, in recent versions of browsers, modern browsers, it does work. So, uh, in, for example, ECMAScript 5 support has been in you know uh, in various degrees in various versions of various browsers. So I cannot say that all of those versions will support all of these properties in, see for example i8 has a partial implementation of some of these uh, capabilities in the DOM, i9 has a full implementation, the behavior kind of changes, the same similar sort of things apply in Firefox, Chrome and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so for the DOM itself, your mileage varies. But for your own objects that you create, you can definitely use it. And the nice thing about ECMAScript 5 is that uh, you will notice that none of this actually introduces new syntax here, right? So when you want to create a new object, you're saying object or create, fine. So that's that's a new uh, capability that's available in ECMAScript 5. But I, I can write uh, I can write shims for pretty much all of these, right? Like if the user that who's coming to your site is using an older version of the browser that does not know about ECMAScript 5, what's going to happen? Now, is it possible for me to write a you know write a object dot create which you know accepts all this and does nothing with it? I can definitely do that, right? Or I can do something reasonably intelligent with it. I can ignore all this because I cannot implement it. So I can create a property called gender and I can set the value to it. So in fact, if you look at the documentation for ECMAScript uh, functionalities in Mozilla, right, you will find that they have provided a, uh, a backward, um, you know, compatible implementation of many of the ES5 capabilities. So if you want to use object.create in your project, but you, you have to support a wide matrix of browsers, brands, and versions and whatnot, you can use these shims. In fact, if you go to the modernizer, uh, you know, page, get, uh, the GitHub page where they have listed the list of polyfills, shims, you know, there are polyfills for ECMAScript 5 also. So you can include that, uh, you know, a JavaScript library in your project. New browsers will simply leverage the new capabilities. Older browsers, it will, you know, you will not get the full capabilities, but it will still work. And that is possible because there is no new syntax. So see, imagine that if they had done something like, you know, uh, from here on, everybody who wants to create an object will write code like this. Uh, make new object and then give type. I'm just cooking up some syntax here. So if they had done this for ECMAScript 5, then you're pretty much screwed, right? You can't you can't use this in your in your code because older browsers just not going to work. You can't provide back, you know, you can't libraries can't do this. Um, they didn't do that, right? So in fact, that's that's like a design philosophy or goal behind ES5. All of this stuff you can simulate to some extent. You can't simulate, for example, writable. With, with an ES3 engine, this is simply not possible. You need support from the engine to do that. But this code can still work, right? So, so that's uh, that's an interesting uh, you know, design. In fact, people ask, you know, there was ES3, ECMAScript version three <coughs> of the standard. Then we have ECMAScript version five, right? So what happened to four? Right? Uh, does the ECMAScript standards body not know how to count? It's not the issue. Uh, so basically, they had introduced a bunch of sweeping changes in ECMAScript 4 that there was no consensus on. They were making syntax changes. You know, they just really wanted to kind of modernize JavaScript, right? And it didn't fly. So they, they said, you know, they kind of scaled back on their ambitions and decided to make ES5. Uh, but you know, many of those you know concepts are still there, right? In the, in the form of APIs like this. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to talk about. Um, there's one probably one last thing that we will probably discuss and we'll be we'll be done. It's still two or or we already out of time, right? No, no, you have till two forty five. Two forty five. Yeah, but we have questions. Yes, I mean yeah, this whole session is like open for questions anytime. Completely or uh, unplugged. But this is another interesting topic that I wanted to kind of talk about. Called variable hoisting. Yes. The second parameter for object dot create is is also an object. It's an object. Yes. So what's the uh, how did, how is that created? I mean that's that's uh, that's JavaScript. So like for example, if you do this, right? Just say name is foo. Now the question is, what is this? Right? What is this object that I got? Right. So let's find out. 
so that that's a good question because now we can look at another API called object dot get prototype of right if uh, this is again in AS5 uh, function you call get prototype of some some object it returns the prototype of that object uh, so I'll say proto is that now <coughs> what could be the prototype any guesses sorry object good guess so uh, let's test that proto equal to equal to equal to uh, object dot prototype so you can say that it's it's true right so that's all it is so if you just create a ob object with this syntax it's simply an object whose prototype is object prototype and the next question would be what's the prototype of object so that's where the bug ends <laughs> right so it doesn't go beyond that that's it the end of the road. <coughs> so, so your question is, what happens if I say proto equals object? I wish they had smaller API names, like that, right? Yeah. Let's first do a type of and see. What do you think is going to print now? Object. Object. <laughs> you know, it's fairly a recent <laughs> guess, right? You can pretty much say type of will give you object. You'll, you'll be right most of the time. <laughs> it's a completely useless operator in my opinion. Uh, so I really don't know what it is. Can I say uh, proto is undefined? Maybe. It's not undefined. Null? It's null. It's object's prototype. It's prototype is null. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> so something else I want to talk about. Ah, so this this operator does this look funny or do you guys know what it's already? No. Is the, the triple equal? To, you normally put two equal to, right? In C, or in C or C++ uh, languages which have you know their syntax origin in C or C++. So you said two equal to for equality. JavaScript put three. You say three equals. And if you want to check for not equals, instead of saying not equals, you'll say not equals equals. Does anyone know why? Type casting that happens. Implicit type casting that happens. Or type conversion, not even casting. Type conversion that happens. So, you know, for example, so, if you. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, say you just uh, uh, made that object right now. Before I tell you, you will do a control gen. Yeah, O. Oh, okay. Hmm. So, O is, uh, o is of uh, prototype object. Objects prototype, yes. Right. So. Is this also backward incompatible? No. This is the same behavior in ES3. Same behavior. ES3 also, if you create an object like this, it's prototype to object. <coughs> so basically, if you, if you did something like this, print 1 equals equals 1 in double quotes, mm -hmm. what is it going to print? So, true. True. so you guys know about this. Right? So that. So it checks for the type, right? It doesn't do implicit type cast, uh, type con conversion. All right. One thing I want to talk about is variable hoisting. Um, <coughs> so let's create a function here like this. Right? <coughs> let's say I have some line like this, line of code like this. Yeah? Uh, I'll just have some if one equals equals one. It's really useless here, right? And I'll declare var. Uh, i equals 10, all right? And then I'm going to say print i. Now my question is, what will it print if I call undefined? How many of you say undefined? One, two, three, four, five people. What do the other people say? Is it going to print 10? How many people say 10? It's about six or seven more. What do the rest of you say? <laughs> okay, it'll print 10. It'll print 10 or undefined those three options. It, it does print 10, right? And you're probably surprised. I mean, if you're coming from a C or C, this is. JavaScript is broken. <laughs> this is not allowed. This is illegal, right? Now the the thing to understand. I mean, I was shocked. Like when I first saw this, like, like 
what this is. I mean, no wonder people, some people have very strong emotions about JavaScript, right? Uh, and they come from a C or C++ and they're forced to work on a web application, they're like, ah, but we want to do this. Before explaining, means can you just put a print type before if? Good, good idea. Print type. So let's ask, let's go through the same poll. What, what's it going to print? Undefined. You're right, it, it, it should print undefined. My console has a problem. Uh, let me just do this. If it's undefined, it won't print anything. I have to fix that. Uh, I'll just do that. I equals equals undefined. Right? And it prints true. It is undefined. Now, I have another global. Um, I say J. What's going to happen now? Sorry? Yeah. Null. Yes. So somebody said reference error. There we are. Oh, there it is. <laughs> so it says reference error J is undefined, right? Uh, but it didn't say that for I, even though I kind of used it the same way, right? I said I is like that. Now when I run this, it prints it is undefined, no, no error. Um, <clears throat> so what's going on? So you know that's what variable hosting is about. So that you no know, need. Uh, so the thing about JavaScript is there is only one construct in the language which introduces scope for variables, and that construct is a function. C, C++, Java, C sharp, all these languages. Anytime you have a block, code block like that, right? Curly curly braces that introduces variable scope. Right? If you declare something inside it, when code control flow exits that block. You know, whatever was declared inside of that gets uh, removed or deallocated and whatnot. JavaScript is not like that. JavaScript, the only construct that introduces variable scope is a function. So when I declare something like this, you know what JavaScript sneakily in the underground goes and does? It does something like this. So it basically takes your variable declaration from inside it and declares it at the top and puts the assignment inside of it. Right, and then that's it. If, if I if I had shown this code, right, nobody would have any issue with those questions. If I print i here, it will be undefined because I didn't assign anything. If I print i here, it will be ten because this is a useless if loop, right? It will go to the class assign ten and it will print ten. This is what JavaScript is doing, right? So this particular concept is called as a variable hoisting. Uh, no matter you know, no matter how nested it is, like you might have a while loop, you have nested loops, whatever it is, inside that any variable that you declare. Uh, uh, you know, without you knowing, JavaScript will take those variable declarations put it at the top. Most of the time, it might work for you because, you know, coming from a, a you know C++ background, for example, you might just use it only in that block, right? But what happens if I did something like this? I have some code later on, right? More useless ifs, where I go and say var i equals uh, new person or whatever, right? Uh, maybe maybe it will still work, but the thing is, the semantics are completely different here, right? Uh, in both the cases, there's only one var i that's being declared at the top, just being reassigned, right? So this could introduce hard to detect bugs if you don't know that's happening. So the the best practice recommendation for this is, so doesn't it go like out of scope after? It doesn't. After what? After but that's what var is supposed after. to do, right? Is it was supposed to do that? If I just make it i equals to 10, then it goes like global. Like, like that is even worse. Okay. I mean, i equals 10 makes it global. It will be out, it will be accessible even outside of 2. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, but yeah, that seems to, I mean, intuitively it sounds like it should be like that. But JavaScript doesn't do that. So it goes and changes your code around, right? So if you declare this, it will go and declare it to the top. It will be as if you declare it like, like this at the top. So what you know what the best practice is around this? Don't do it. <laughs> Simple best practice. Uh, so what the, what you know seriously though what the best practice is? Declare everything on the top. So that's the because then you have explicitly it becomes obvious to anybody who's reading the code that all this declared here you know what the scope of that variable is <coughs> because if it is if it is inside uh, you know blocks like this it's implicit. I mean you, unless somebody knows that all this is happening you wouldn't. Uh, be able to infer, you know, uh, what the behavior is likely. Do so we have a question? Yeah. Is that is because is this behavior a part of like a design philosophy or is it just a quirk? It's, you would have to just blame on the tight deadline to find the machine. Right. I mean, this is a quirk. I would say. No, but why hasn't like uh, why can't we fix it like when you have ECMA, ECMA five? That's the, that's the brain of the web, right? Backward compatibility. 
I mean, if you go and do this, go fix the lack. Mean, there are so many thugs in JavaScript. Why don't why not just fix it? I don't know with how many websites you stop working, right? How many other applications stop? Maybe somebody wrote code knowing that this is happening and they're making advantage of it. I don't know, right? Once, see, that's the thing about shipping code. Once you ship it, you are stuck with it forever. It's support. So be really, really careful before you ship stuff, right? That's the same thing with APIs. Once you put an API out there, unless you want to piss your developers off, stick with your API, right? Your interface, you can't change it. Yeah. But there isn't an alternative for JavaScript, right? <laughs> alternative for JavaScript? I mean, I don't know. If you are Google, then there is. <laughs> CopyScript is there. That's like a method. It's language on top of. There was a session on it today, right? It's on top of JavaScript, right? It's a, it's a compiler for JavaScript. CopyScript is a language where it limits JavaScript. Google is coming out with a uh, language called what? Dart. 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 They are, and you know, if Google had its way, then everybody would start each other just But I don't think that's going to happen. I think just is going to stick with us for a very long time. Uh, otherwise, we won't have this content there. So, but ultimately, browsers execute JavaScript. No matter you write to CoffeeScript, you have to convert them. Yes. So, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, yes. I mean, CoffeeScript is good. I actually like the language, and you know, some of these constructs are really nice. But yeah, ultimately it just compiles and produces JavaScript and it runs in your browser as it produces good quality JavaScript actually. Should we start off with JavaScript first or should we first focus on JavaScript or CoffeeScript? I would recommend that focus on JavaScript. As in learn what, what it does. See, one of the problems with JavaScript, with CoffeeScript, I don't know what the status of the problem currently is with debugging. Because what is actually running in the browser is JavaScript, not CoffeeScript. Right? So if you have a problem, how do you debug? What do you, you have to understand JavaScript code. You have to understand JavaScript code. JavaScript code. So you are writing in CoffeeScript but debugging in JavaScript. So you still have to know JavaScript. But a lot of uh, languages already started taking, a lot of like frameworks already started taking CoffeeScript right now. Like uh, Rails. So what about that? No, but yeah, I mean, that's good. So you are coding in just, uh, in CoffeeScript. So, so you can code. use all the best practices. But as of today, CoffeeScript doesn't seem to have a good story around debugging. Maybe they'll fix it. When In that case, that would be great. But right now, if you want to debug your web app, that is in your browser. Let's say one particular annoying user tells you that this is not working for me, right? So you have no option other than to debug JavaScript, right? <coughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, even from a learning point of view, I think it makes sense to know what is actually going on. So learn JavaScript, uh, CoffeeScript. Learn no, not, not just the user needs to when you write in CoffeeScript, sometimes because of the white space issues, it generates a different code that you expect. Really? Okay. It does. That, that's the that's person I mean, job, copy script is so white space. Your code doesn't work for the first time itself. When you thought something else, and because you have a tab instead of a space, and created something else. Maybe oh, you, can, you can try using editors. You know, uh, which no, you can make your editor for it. Correct. And the same thing is like, like Python, right? It's correct. Right. It's exactly. Actually, I mean, uh, white space significant. <coughs> but it's not compatible. All right. So I think uh, we've run out of time. Uh, I will do that. No, we really have another thing. So we'll take take it off. Like, thanks. Thank you very much.